Lovers, season 12 of Dates and Mates is here. But before we get into the episode, I wanted to let you know about another special thing that is coming up, the Dates and Mates Method. This is my signature program that only launches once a year. Once a year, you have an opportunity to get hands-on experience in dating from me and my team. We work with you in weekly Zoom sessions. I give you my entire dating accelerator program and online course. And then we work in small group sessions, in partner work. We go through worksheets. We help you write scripts. We give you the practice in dating that you need before you get out there into the wild and get all the butterflies and get all the feelies. We help you work it out in a safe and structured community environment. So that happens just once a year. And just this week only, we are doing a $500 discount for our early bird, early actors, the people who listen to this podcast, who've been waiting for season 12 to premiere and who know that they are ready to date differently this year. The moment is now. You can find out all about the program at demonahoffman.com slash method. The link is in the show notes, of course, but that $500 off deal that's only available until August 25th. So don't wait to make the decision. Say yes to dating differently. Say yes. Take my outstretched hand and this $500 discount to walk with me through a completely new way of dating and hopefully into the arms of the person that you dream of being with this year. Find out more at DemonaHoffman.com slash method. Now on with the show. Does this mean it's over? Does this mean he likes me? Are butterflies good? Am I ever going to meet someone? I'm tired of swiping. Am Am I I normal? normal? One of the best ways to make sure that you're happy and healthy is productive conflict. You can keep waiting for the fairy tale or you can get on board with the new rules of relationships. If you've watched me on NBC's Access Daily, then you know this ain't your mama's love advice. This is Dates and Mates with Demona Hoffman. Hello, lovers. Welcome to a thrilling new episode of Dates and Mates. It is so thrilling because we are kicking off season 12 of this podcast. Okay, let's get real here for a second. Did you know that only 8% of podcasts even make it to 10 episodes? Yeah, that's right. Most podcasts fizzle out before they even hit double digits, but here we are, not just passing that milestone, but absolutely smashing it with episode 522. That puts us in the top 1%, baby. And it's not by chance, though. We're here because we're more than just a podcast. We are your go-to resource for everything dating, whether you're looking for advice, insight, a good laugh, or a sense of community. In my VIP calls and Facebook group, we've got you covered. So thank you for taking this journey with me and the Dates and Mates family. And thank you for being a part of what makes this podcast so great. In fact, I want to shout out some of our listeners on this show. So you can send me a congratulations message or tell me your favorite segment or topic or guest when you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. And then I get to shout you out and personally say thank you on a future episode. So it's a new season for Dates and Mates and a new dating overview for you. We have been on this journey together for over 11 years, so it feels like it's time for a comprehensive episode on the state of the date today. And joining me to do this is licensed professional therapist Jeff Gunther, though you likely know him on Instagram as Therapy Jeff. He will be sharing insights from his new book, Big Dating Energy, which covers every stage of authentic dating from deciding what you're looking for to the date itself to the commitment phase, and even how to end things in the best way possible if things are headed in that direction. So it's going to be a live one. And then we will go into our Dear Demona question of the week. On the agenda today, Dear Demona, what's the best way to reach out to someone on LinkedIn? Ooh, LinkedIn love, just in time for fall. I'm intrigued. More on that later. But now it's time for Therapy Jeff. Jeff Gunther has 20 years of experience in private practice. Therapy Jeff, as you probably know him, hosts the Big Dating Energy podcast, and he co-hosts This Changes Everything, another fantastic podcast. He's been interviewed on NPR, Time, CNN, Rolling Stone, Business Insider, Slate. I could go on and on, but what I really want to do is give some big smooches to my guest, Therapy Jeff. 
Hi, how's it going? It's going well. I, I'm glad that we got consent for those smooches because I know your audience is very big on the consent, on doing things the right way. So mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're starting off on a good note, right? Yes, informed consent. We love it. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. good. So you have a new book. I'm super excited to talk to you about it. We, we talked on Instagram. Oh, gosh, that was like six months ago yeah. um, when it was just a twinkle in your eye. But now the book is out. Big dating energy. How are you feeling? <laughs> the, the actual writing of the book, which took like five or six months, was the best part. It was me and my co-author, Kate. We wrote this book. We did a great job. But all the other stuff about writing, marketing, publicity, editing over and over and over again, even like the the cover design. I was just like, cool. Can we end this? Can we just pick a cover now and go with it? (laughs) So uh, the writing part was fun. All the other stuff was a little stressful. Um, I'm glad that we're on the other side of it so that now people can like actually experience it. And I have experienced the book therapy, Jeff, and it's fantastic and super comprehensive. Like you really my producer Lindsay and I were talking before the interview and we're like, there's literally nothing that isn't in this book. It's like every phase of dating into the relationship, into the breakup. So you really went in and you and your co-author who you brought up, I didn't bring it up, but you brought up Kate Hap, your co-author who you also reveal in the book is your Mm ex-wife. What is that like? What is that like writing a book with your ex-wife about dating? I know, right? Well, we were we were together for about nine or ten years. We were married for like seven or eight of those years. And while we were together, we worked on projects together. And a lot of those projects were writing projects. So we sort of fell into becoming a writing team where um, I would do writing. I'd give it to her and we'd pass it back and forth, back and forth. Uh, so when the opportunity came up to write a book, I was like, I feel like I just got to write it with my writing partner. And Kate was, uh, excited to do that. We divorced in 2019. So right before the pandemic and that pandemic lockdown period sort of gave us this space. I'm just like, all right, now we're living in different spaces. The marriage is over. Um, We're going to take a break from maybe like talking or connecting as much as we did. Um, And then we sort of naturally came back to each other and uh, our relationship. One of the best parts of our relationship was just that there's a really strong friendship base and that never left. So we connected back through being friends. And then I was like, do you want to write this book together? And she said, yes. And I think that it would have been a lot more difficult to write this book if we were married. It was actually easier to write it outside of the marriage because, you know, when you're married, there's, or in relationship, there's just sort of like a, you know, is this, does this feel balanced? Is this fair? Are you pulling your weight? Like, and there's, there's a lot of like loaded stuff, everyday stuff that gets into relationships that emotionally charged things that maybe don't need to be as emotionally charged. So we didn't have like, we're in a relationship and we need to sort shit out. And why haven't we had sex in a week or something? It was just, we're writing a book. We're friends. We know how to be writing partners. And it turned out really well. It did. It did. And I also appreciated, not only did you bring a lot of humor to the book and a lot of sort of the signature therapy, Jeff persona to Mm -hmm. the writing that we know so well from TikTok and Instagram. But you also reveal some of your own beliefs, some of like as you're asking the reader to go through certain exercises, you're like, this is how I would answer this. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that that must be in some ways challenging (laughs) as a, a content creator and helper in this space to then open up. Because I I know I get questions all the time like, Mm -hmm. well, how are you a dating coach if you've been married for 17 years? You know, I'm sure people want to know what is your status when you're giving dating Mm -hmm. advice? How much of that were you aware of when you sat down to write this book? And how did that factor into your choice of what to include? So I get sort of the opposite of that feedback where people will be like, oh, you're you're like an ex a dating expert and you're divorced. 
you know, like you're not in like a long term relationship and you're helping people find those relationships. Why should I listen to you sort of thing? So there's always like doubters out there and it's just something that you have to kind of tolerate. I feel like really, you know, I have this lived experience as uh, uh, right now is like I'm dating. I've been dating for a long time. I was married for about eight years there. Um, but now I'm like in the trenches with all of you, you know, uh, and there's a certain amount of how much you're going to reveal, whether it's in the book or in my videos. And the thing is, is that like one of the appealing things about me that people enjoy connecting with me on is that they get these little tidbits of how I feel and what, how I would answer those questions. And I hope to answer this, like in the, in the ways that I sort of like make reveals in the book, I'm just sort of saying, this is what I would say. This is what I would think. And it's totally okay if you feel differently or if you answer this question in like a, the opposite way, you know? Um, but I think it sort of helps people connect with me and see that I'm a real person and that I have preferences. And it's also like a fun time to kind of joke around and be a little clever or something or snarky. <laughs> so it, it helps me to kind of like have fun while I'm writing. Yeah. I, I found it really instructive too, because, you know, I've been coaching daters for a very long time. And I have my tent poles and my myths and my pillars, which we talked about when we did our Instagram. But the specificity, I think, was really instructive in in big dating energy. Like you talk about make your lists. That's um, that's a core element of the book, making your lists of fears and defenses, non-negotiables and deal breakers. And mm -hmm. I thought that your list of deal breakers, Jeff, was so <laughs> helpful because, oh, no, seriously, seriously, because sometimes I'll say, okay, we need, uh, you know, I say a similar thing in F the Fairy Tale of you need your must haves. And I, you're very generous, Jeff. I give folks one deal breaker because <laughs> I think we could talk ourselves out of anything. And I've True. just seen so many lists of deal breaker, deal breaker, deal breaker. And most of the time when I look at those deal breaker lists, it's not actually a deal breaker. Maybe know, it's like an right? ick or an annoyance or a preference, right? So what's a deal breaker? <laughs> <laughs> I try to be like really specific about this. Like, okay, everybody, a deal breaker has to actually be a deal breaker where if it showed up in the relationship, you're done, you're out, you're breaking up, right? And it can't just be these icks or flaws or imperfections. Um, you know, like a... a an imperfection or a flaw or ick might be like, uh, they tell dad jokes. First of all, that's fucking adorable. Second of all, <laughs> like you can tolerate that, especially if there's lots of, you know, green flags in other areas of the relationship. Right. Um, I, but you know, it, I don't know why that is where it feels like, I mean, I think there's lots of reasons where icks and flaws and, and imperfections turn into red flags because, I mean, we're, you're trying to like protect yourself. You're trying to make sure you match up with somebody who's a good fit. You want to make sure that it's like you got the best chance ever. But there's also like the, the endless scroll on dating apps where it seems like if somebody doesn't like meet all of your, your entire checklist, then you can just like go back into that and in, onto the apps and find somebody that's find somebody who might be a better match for you but that's not ever really the case like nobody's ever going to check off your entire list so i just try to be like what's a deal breaker what is a non-negotiable these are like extreme things that if it was showing up like the way that they handled their anger is scary um or they're like extreme political views that are opposite of yours if that's a big deal breaker fine but you got it. These are only things that you would leave the relationship for. Yeah, it was very instructive. And it really clarified like deal breaker is not they, you know, clip their toenails <laughs> right. at exactly. the dinner table. Like that's an annoyance. But like some of the examples you, you gave in the book, someone who can't be empathetic to my experience, like that is that is so clear, Jeff, like mm -hmm. to and what I love having my clients do is to really get into what is the feeling of the relationship you want to have. We can make, you know, I call the, in my book, I call the myth, the list myth a myth because most of the lists I see are six feet tall, makes this much money. I'm literally going through this even it's, and you address this in big dating energy, how the, the media we've consumed, the fairy tales, the rom-coms, 
the, our our families of origin give us this set of beliefs that we really it's it's really our job to unpack mm-hmm. the, these beliefs about what we need in a relationship and like for example i have ha- i have recently i had a i've had two new clients come to me over 60 saying that they're they're the people they're meeting are not at their intellectual level or their um their education level mm. and they're not they haven't they're not making enough money mm. and it's like wait a minute that was what you needed maybe when you were 25 mm-hmm. but is that really what you need when you're 60 and you've already look you got your own house like you've you've built your career you're already successful what do you actually need? You need somebody who's going to be empathetic and kind, <laughs> right? You need yeah. somebody who's not going to be quick to anger, as you said. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's, it's part of the work is is digging under there. <laughs> yeah, digging under it, and and like you know, going ahead. I was also just talking to somebody who was like, I have. They need to make a minimum amount of money. Uh, and it's a deal breaker if they make less money than I do. Uh, and I'm like, okay, let's break that down. Like, uh, why is that? And they're like, well, because I don't want to take care of them because I want them to be like financially stable. I don't want to like have financial anxiety running through. And it's like, okay, well, they can make half of what you make and also have really good financial boundaries and live a life where they feel really secure about the money that they're bringing in and, and know that there's going to be I wanna, separate bank accounts or something, you know? Uh, so if you can dig into where that's coming from, or like you're saying, or we're saying, if you're getting all these ideals from your family who think, you know, who has your best interest in mind, but maybe doesn't know you personally, like, or doesn't like know what you, what would be best for you, or maybe from like the culture or media or Hollywood or Disney or reality shows or whatever it is, like, where is this coming from? And does it actually resonate with who you authentically are? And if it's a deal breaker, where does that come from? Can we break it down? Is it just sort of like a defense mechanism? Is it something that you think needs to be there, but doesn't actually need to be there? Because like you're saying, if it's people who are six feet tall, I think it was Logan Yuri who like who who works at Hinge and also wrote her book, How Not to Die Alone, I think. she She's like, okay, well, on Hinge, uh, men, there's only 11% of men that are over six feet tall. So now you're wiping out 89% of the men on Hinge because you have this deal breaker of only being over six foot. And you know that if you met somebody in person and there were 5'10", but they were, they seemed like a really good match, a really good catch, that 5'10 would not matter to you. And like height is not the thing that's going to make a relationship healthy. Right. So it feels very arbitrary. I wonder if that's where your fears list comes in. Mm Because like you mentioned, the money fear, like Mm -hmm. I don't want to be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. Is that is that how those lists communicate with one another? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, there's there's a lot of like uh, a lot of times the people that I'm talking to. My demographic, like 85% of my demographic is millennial women. And a lot of these women have been in relationships uh, that were upsetting or created like, you know, they had these like fearful experiences and they understand the things that, you know, the defenses that people can have uh, that just don't resonate with them. And it's also kind of like... <sighs> we're all going to get triggered in relationships. Relationships make you kind of reveal sort of like these, like the trauma or these emotionally messy parts of you. What are different parts of people that you feel like you can tolerate or even empathize with or be okay with? Um, Cause sometimes we, somebody can be like, okay, you're being really angry. You're getting really upset. You're raising your voice. All right, whatever I'm here. But another person might be like, there's absolutely no way. I'm going to tolerate that sort of behavior. And I want you all to be able to check in with yourself on, about it. Yeah. Different people will bring out different sides mm-hmm. of sides of us. So I think to me, that's like, that's part of the excitement of this whole process. I mm-hmm. love the process of dating because it really is a journey in self-discovery. And we have a lot more here to shed light on. But first, we need to take a quick break and bring to light the sponsors. 
who help us bring Dates and Mates to you absolutely free. Thank you for supporting our sponsors and the Dates and Mates community. Let's get back to our interview just in time for things to get a little spicy. Okay, you brought up, <laughs> you brought up the D word, <laughs> dating apps. Uh-huh. And, you know, we didn't really get to get, go too in depth with this when we had our IG live. But we, I feel like we are so aligned in our approach in many ways. But one thing folks will note from seeing, seeing your videos and seeing my videos is that I tend to be very pro dating apps and have been for a long time. Um, what, what did you call it? Dating apps in big dating energy, chaotic evil. <laughs> um, and you do give, you do give great dating app tips in the book, sure. but I, I just wanted to get a sense of where you sit, where you stand on dating apps right now. I think that you have like, I think, you know, I, I, I know that you view dating apps as a tool and just like maybe like one way to meet people and get out there. And I think that's one of the ways that we align is like, fine, you're going to do dating apps, understand that it's one of a handful of ways that you can meet people. Yeah. So I'm like, don't like a hundred percent count on it. I typically see people a hundred percent counting on it and they're not like putting themselves out there in different ways. But the reason that I don't like dating apps and it's also my answer to this question that I can't stand being asked anymore, but I also can't stop answering, which is like, why is it harder to date these? Or do you think it's harder to date these days compared to like past generations? Just like, ugh, okay. Um, the thing is, is I do. <laughs> I do think it's harder because of these dating apps, because the dating apps are uh, like, they are out there. The people who created them want to make money. And they understand the best way to make money is to actually keep you on the dating app. So they're like marketing savvy might be like, we want you to delete the app. That is the goal. And it's just like, is it the goal though? Because it's not going to line your pockets if I'm deleting these apps. So there's an algorithm in there that's going to keep me coming back. They're not going to show me all the, what they think are the best matches because then I would leave the app again. They're going to take some of those best matches and keep them behind a paywall so that I have to pay for them. So if I want to use it for free, then it's going to work even uh, worse for me. Uh, And it's the same addictive quality of any other social media app. Uh, And I don't like that they're getting in between me and meeting somebody. If it was just a dating app that showed everybody that's like your closest location or whatever, like closest to you, fine, that's great. If you can have basic filters, okay. But they're trying to get you to never delete the app. So I don't like that there's this ulterior motive, which I understand they're a business. We live in capitalism. They're trying to make money, but their main goal is for their investors, not for me to actually find love. That is just my theory. I, you know, I'm just Mm -hmm. like, I don't know if that's actually true. Uh, but it feels true in my soul. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> uh, so I agree that the dating apps are there to make money. They always right. have been, right? Sure. I think the, and you know, I, I met my husband online when it was a dating site before apps. And mm. I think the, the game really changed when Tinder entered the scene Agreed. because it became one, the way that we used, use the tool changed. It became much more transactional. You knew a lot less about the person and the functionality. As you were saying, it was about like, keep playing. And it was all of that marketing stuff and all of the al- algorithm things and mm-hmm. the, the, the things that we love to hate about social media as well right. that draw us in, but at the same time, hijack our brains. Mm-hmm. And that's when I think it, it required a certain level of boundaries and responsibility with the app that hadn't really existed before. So while I do like that it 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 eliminated or reduced the stigma of dating apps and it made like my big point about dating apps is that it makes options accessible to you who you otherwise might not have met. And also for people like particularly for people who are divorced, uh, single parents, people who have very busy jobs, like you can 
you can you can make the dating app work for your life. That said, I'm fully acknowledging that a lot of folks haven't. And we've, the same way that I feel like, I saw you were taking a social media break. I feel like we've, we've let some of this technology um, be in the driver's seat of our lives mm -hmm. rather than us telling the technology <laughs> Definitely. where it's going to sit in our lives. Uh, I think dating apps have um, have taken us to that place and most people are not, not really using it with those boundaries in place because no one has told us to. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you just get it, yeah. like you start doing Instagram because it's fun, you start doing TikTok because it's fun and the next thing you know, that's your life. <laughs> yeah, and I've never, I don't, I don't, and anytime I'm taking a social media break of like posting a lot of content online because it's it's uh, the three years that I've been therapy, Jeff, and then posting content online, I have never had to manage my mental health more than in any other time for like in my life. There's been spurts here and there where I really had to like figure shit out, but not consistently for three years where it's it, where I felt like addicted to creating content and being online and absorbing content and getting the validation and trying to get the praise and feeling horrible when uh, I, when a video didn't have the impact that I wanted it to or being attacked or being made fun of what that doesn't really have much to do with the dating apps but <laughs> it's the it same does, though. like it does there's yeah. there's a crossover there and so now yeah. when I go on TikTok or Instagram uh whenever I go on TikTok and then and then leave TikTok. I'm never like, I feel refreshed. That was a great experience. I'm always just like, I always end those times being like, oh, why am I doing this? Right. And I feel yeah. gross about it. And the dating apps, when I'm on them, this is just personal anecdotal, but like when I'm on them, I also feel the same way. I'm like, oh God, I got to get off of this shit. Like they know how to make me get the dopamine hits and the, the 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 little validations that I get on those apps. Um so if you can go into those dating apps with really good boundaries and 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 check in with yourself emotionally and mentally about how you're feeling, um only look at it every couple of days or come up with some sort of thing that will make you feel like you have a healthier relationship, then great. I think that you should do that. I'm not super confident that everybody can do that. I almost believe that like the dating app, like uh, people that have like created these applications are smarter than us and they keep on outsmarting <laughs> us with how they're going to get us addicted to it. Um, but I agree. Boundaries, healthy relationship with dating apps. It can happen, but let's just not like it's only a tool and like, you know, explore it in real life too. If you could wave a magic wand and make a global change to dating app culture or the operation of dating apps what would what would make it feel better for you if they didn't make money if it was like <laughs> if it was like a basic if it was like you know how like medicare for all you know you don't have to like spend money on it <laughs> like if it was just dating apps for all and you didn't have to actually like there was just one that worked really well and they weren't trying to like play some algorithmic trick on us, then mm -hmm. I'm into it. But there's also the like, it's hard to actually, a lot of times when you're on a dating app, I think whether you know it or not, it's more of like a hot or not game that you're playing because their mm -hmm. picture shows up. The first thing that you see is like how attracted you are to them or not. So it's very visually based, which like, of course, it's great to be attracted to your partner. We kind of need that, you know. Um, but when you meet somebody in real life, sure, you're like looking at them in real life, but there's also you're feeling their vibe, their nonverbal cues. There's like these different types of flirts that can happen. A conversation where you're not attracted to somebody all of a sudden turns into a really interesting conversation where you feel like you're attracted to them. So all that nuance is lost in dating apps. Yeah. You should move to Tokyo because they're starting a a state sponsored dating app there. Really? So <laughs> <laughs> they are and they're and we just did an episode last season about um people considering dating apps uh, a company benefit a mental mm. health benefit so mm -hmm. hey maybe 
maybe we can we can change the world together, you and I. If I'm, I, I would move there and use their dating app only if I was the one that created the dating app that had full control over it. I, I can't imagine that if, with the government creating it, it's any better <laughs> I know, than what we have. Thing. But yeah. but I sure am curious. I sure am curious. Okay, so that uh, this is just like the tip of the iceberg in big dating energy. Um, and, and I alluded at the top that you don't just get into dating, but you also you give a long term relationship survival guide. What what are your top tips? for mm-hmm. surviving a relationship? Should anyone listening be past that that initial <laughs> dating phase? Sure, yeah. Almost like half the book is about like, all right, you're in a relationship. Let's make sure it's healthy and you're getting your needs met. And if you want it to last a long time, if you're into that, let's figure out how we can make sure that it does. Um, and there's a whole chapter also on conflict. And mm. as a couples counselor for 20 years, I have seen all the fights uh, with like couples coming in, people in relationship coming in and getting into arguments in front of me. So I feel like one of the best ways to make sure that you're happy and healthy is that you're having productive conflict where it's actually, this, I'm going to sound like such a therapist here, but like where it's actually an opportunity for growth and connection. Each conflict gives you that. And it's hard to not fall into the I'm right and I'm going to prove you wrong sort of style of, of conflict. It's because when you're angry or you're in a fight with your partner, like they, it feels like they've obviously done something wrong. And if you can just convince them <laughs> that they've done something wrong, then you'll hear those magical words of you are right. I was wrong the whole time. Like uh, I'll never do it again, which is impossible. Nobody's ever going to say, I've never witnessed that in my 20 years of being a therapist where somebody tried to convince them that they were wrong and they're like, you're right, I was wrong. Uh, So it's more about like, how can uh, both of your experiences be valid and truthful at the same time? Uh, So if you're going to have a long-term relationship that's really healthy, then a lot of it is about when you're in conflict, you're uh, validating the emotional experience that your partner is having, and then they're able to validate the emotional experience that you're having. Uh, So there's conflict. There's also always like sex issues in relationships. Sometimes we start to think that... um, if we don't have the same desire, then that's a red flag. If we don't want to do all the same stuff in bed, then that's a red flag. Uh, but sex gets weird. I I have to also commend you for that chapter. And you even give questions that you can ask after you've had sex with someone mm-hmm. to kind of reflect, reflective, self-reflective <laughs> questions. But it's really instructive because I hear a lot from clients like, oh, well, we had sex for the first time and it wasn't great. So it's not a match. And like, I feel like now in dating culture, we're front loading sex as like one of the filters, like must be, Mm -hmm. must be six feet tall or taller, must make this much money, must satisfy me in bed the first time we have sex without me telling them anything. Right. And I just, I'm with you. I think that most, most sexual challenges most can be improved, maybe not totally solved, but can be improved actually through better communication. Yeah, exactly. Like you got to talk about it. And this might not be true for everybody, but in in the book, I encourage folks to try it right after you're done with sex and you're doing the whatever cuddling or laying there or chatting a little bit, ask them, be like, What was your favorite thing that you experienced? Was there something that you wanted me to focus on even more or pay more attention to? Is there, is, was I too rough? Was I too soft? Did I talk enough or too little? Like, give me some feedback. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. And I'm also going to give you feedback about my favorite part and what I want to explore next time. And usually after you have sex or a lot of times after you have sex, there's like this real, lovey-dovey connection where it feels very sweet. You're both feeling satisfied, hopefully. Um, and you can kind of like plan for the next one. And, and when you talk about sex after sex is done, it can also lead to flirtation, which then like will, you know, uh, add energy to the next time you end up doing it. I think it was like, is it Esther Perel who says that 
um, like flirtation or something needs to start the moment that sex stops and that you need to like, mm-hmm. kind of like keep on doing it until you have sex again. And there's also another, there's like Dr. Karen Gurney who wrote a, a book about sex. She talks about sexual currency where a lot of times when you're in long-term relationships, you're like, who took out the trash? Mm-hmm. Who's picking up the food? Did you, who's going to get the kids? What's, on TV and that's not sexy. It's just sort of like living your life as roommates together. But in, before, like during the honeymoon stage, sometimes there's a lot of sexual currency where you're flirting, you're sending sexy texts, you're planning dates, you're putting on your outfit because you think you're, you're going to look real cute. And there's just so much like sexual energy that's built up. And if you don't continue to create that deliberately as the relationship goes on, then things might feel a little stale. Yeah, I'm with you. You have yeah. to you have to create it. I make a point of scheduling date nights and I've done this for, you know, we've been together t- over 20 years. Mm-hmm. But knowing that it's the intentionality that mm-hmm. really keeps the the momentum of the relationship going is really important. But sometimes it just doesn't work out. And you yeah. also cover breakups. Uh, and, you know, I, f- I find that I've read a lot of dating books in this space. Um, and there's, there's like breakup books and then there's dating books. Mm-hmm. And your book is one of the first ones that I've read that really addresses, like I said, the whole gamut of, mm-hmm. the, of the, the entire lifespan of a relationship. <laughs> Mm-hmm. What what do you think? What is most important for you for readers to take away from that chapter on the tender art of breaking up? Yeah, it, I, that was maybe my favorite chapter, and it was also a chapter that I was kind of writing to myself. I am I have historically I've improved, but I have historically been a bad breaker upper because I feel so guilty about breaking somebody's heart. I'm such a heartbreaker is what I feel. And so like, I don't want to like make somebody sad. I start to feel like, oh, you know, they'll be depressed forever if I end this relationship. It's not true. But I start to kind of like over empathize with the person. And because of that, I feel too guilty to actually end things or I start to kind of like slowly pull away and not even knowingly, but I start to kind of disconnect in a way where they maybe start to think about ending the relationship or having a chat with me about like what's going on here. I think it's very natural for all of us to want to avoid breaking up with somebody because it's it might be the hardest thing that you do in that relationship. So I get why that's a very difficult thing to attempt. But if we want to be ethical daters and good breaker uppers, we need to be really straightforward and direct and honest about it. I think hmm. at some point in the book, I make a recommendation that never goes over well, but I still made it, which is, uh, and you can give me your feedback on this. It's okay if you disagree. Um, I think it was the chapter in like, okay, lock that cutie down where you're like defining Mm -hmm. the relationship. And one of the questions I want people to ask is, okay, we're together, we're exclusive or whatever we've decided here. Um, Let me ask you a question. One of them is like, what counts as cheating? Cool. You should discuss that. Another one is how do you want me to break up with you if we if I if I end this relationship? Because that is something that is helpful for me to know. Like, do you want me what day do you want me to break up with you? For me, it's a Friday because I would like the weekend to recover. Uh, what time do you want me to break up? Well, in the evening time, obviously, because I don't want to start my day like that. Uh, do you want me to like text you or call you or FaceTime you or do it in person? Actually, I would want you to text me so that I can decide and consent to the way that I want this breakup conversation to go. I'll maybe just text you back or I'll ask for a phone call or in person. Uh, there's, I have like very specific requests for how you're going to break up with me. And now here's a blueprint. And if you ever want to end this relationship, just do the blueprint. Obviously, you don't have to. You can break up with me in your own creative way if you feel inspired to do that. But it's helpful 
if you if I already know going into it, the feedback I get is usually like, that seems like a real downer. And I'm like, actually, <laughs> you're so into each other that it's easier to talk about when you're in an argument or something. You know what I mean? I don't know. How do you feel about that question? I don't think it's a downer. I think it's it's sort of like, okay, now I'm really going to turn this into a downer. I'm like, <laughs> okay. you know, I, it's sort of like doing your estate plan. Like I have children, I have a house. I'm like, I have to have a will and an estate plan and like what happens. Sure. And like, it's not like fun to talk about. <laughs> like, okay, well, if I die and if you die at the right. same time, then, you know, then what happens? But ha- it's so interesting how having those high sort of high stakes conversations at a time when those stakes are not on, mm-hmm. it actually can really deepen your relationship. So mm-hmm. I love it. Like go back to the owner's manual of like, mm-hmm. okay, now we I have to refer back to chapter yeah. four in big dating energy when <laughs> therapy right? Jeff said, This is how I'm supposed to break up with you. And it, it's just I, I'm I'm really big on creating communication codes of conduct mm-hmm. and for ourselves and for other people so that we we have a mutual understanding because I think especially with so many different ways of communicating. I mean, you talk in the book about DMs and texts and and app communication and in person and in a relationship and dating. Mm -hmm. And these are all sort of different micro languages that we have not yet evolved to to universally understand. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's important to do just what you're saying and to create that dictionary for yourself and the people that you're dating. Yeah. And it also kind of goes hand in hand with just coming up with a plan. And I think that, and that's another thing that I talk to my couples about in couples counseling is that, uh, you know, okay, so there's some very obvious, uh, predictable fights that you keep on getting into. Um, When you get into that fight, once again, for the millionth time, let's come up with a plan of how you can respond to it differently. Or if tragedy strikes, let's come up with a plan of what you're going to do in order to navigate it. Sometimes the plan works really well. Sometimes it's only like 50% well, whatever, but at least you have something there and you have this sort of like code of conduct. Um, Let's come up with a plan of like, uh, what happens if there's like uh, infidelity or somebody cheats on someone? How are you going to handle that? Uh, and when we don't come up with plans, it gets kind of messy sometimes. And then you find yourself in my office, which is fine. Then we'll come up with a new plan for when you all come in. One of the experiences that I have and that I hear a lot of people having is um, when you do sit down to have a breakup conversation, sometimes that is the most intimate, vulnerable conversation you've had in a really long time. We are being really honest. We are being really authentic and telling them how you feel. And then they tell you how they're feeling. And all of a sudden, there's this connection of like, oh, this is what I wanted. This is how I wanted to feel. And then you don't break up. (laughs) And it's like, it's so tempting to just not break up, even though you wanted to break up because now you feel more connected than ever. So I'm trying to like encourage people to not fall for that, but also empathize with the fact that sometimes you're going to fall for that. Yes. Unpopular opinion, but very wise words from Jeff Gunther. Make sure you're following Therapy Jeff on Instagram and you're going to want to get a copy of his new book, Big Dating Energy, How to Create Lasting Love by Tapping into Your Authentic Self wherever you get your books. The links will be in the show notes. In a moment, I'll be back to answer the following listener question. Want to slide into the DMs on LinkedIn, but don't want it to seem creepy? Is that a thing? I'll tell you in just a moment. Yes, yes, yes. Dear Damona is back and here to help you with your love dilemmas. We have a juicy one, perfect for the professional set. This one came to us in an Instagram DM from a listener named Chris. He says, Dear Damona, I enjoyed your dating decoded webinar and I learned a lot. I know you get a ton of DMs, but it'd be great to get your advice. What's the best way to reach out to someone new on LinkedIn without sounding creepy? Use your PS world method. It turns out we have a mutual connection, but there's no profile picture and I can't click on it. So I don't know who it is. I could use the connector circle if I find out our mutual connection. Please help. All right, let me give you a little dates and mates method dictionary before we go into answering this question, because there are a few words that Chris 
very expertly threw out there that come from my playbook that you might not know. So he said, should I use your PS world method? The PS world method is a technique for approaching people IRL in real life. PS world. P stands for personal. You can approach them by saying something that is personal, about them personally. It could be a comment on what they're wearing. It could be something about their smile. It could be something else that you notice about them themselves personally. S stands for space. This is something about the space that you're in physically. So you are you notice other people around you or uh, let's say I have a client that is going to a mixer and an art museum. There's plenty of things to talk about in this space in an environment like that. The last one is world. This is something happening somewhere in the world. So, you know, we just ended the Olympics. Did you watch the Olympics? What sport did you like the best? This is, uh, try to stay away from politics if you can, but uh, as we get closer to November, that's going to be harder and harder. So maybe something like that, maybe current events, reality TV. I don't know. The Golden Bachelorette just announced her bachelor's. So that's something to talk about. Have you? Did you see the announcement? There can be anything happening in current events. So PS World is for in-person communication. It doesn't work the same for sliding in the DMs, but I will cover the DM slide in a minute. I have to clarify what a connector circle is. What is a connector circle? Connector circle is a method for getting people who are second degree connections to introduce you to people in their circle because your first degree connections, the people you already know personally, probably would have set you up with somebody if they knew you were looking and they knew someone who was right. So we want to go a level deeper. I go into all of this in much more detail in the Dates and Mates Method program, which, by the way, is enrolling now. We start up in September. So I won't go into all of the details here, but if you're interested in learning those techniques, practicing those techniques, I'd love to have you join me live for that program, demonahoffman.com slash method. Okay, back to your regularly scheduled programming. How do you slide in the DMs and how do you specifically slide in the DMs on LinkedIn? Now, I did do an episode a while back, saying that LinkedIn has become a de facto dating app. All of the apps have become de facto dating apps, like any app you're on. I've had a client that met somebody on a language learning app, somebody that was like just looking to to find a partner to speak languages and and found someone to, you know, speak the language of love with. (laughs) So any app you're on can be a dating app. That said, LinkedIn is a little bit tricky because most people are there for business, not for you to approach them romantically. So I find that there's like a little bit of a wall up that people are not going to be as receptive to an advance on LinkedIn. What you need to do on LinkedIn that's different than another DM slide where you can be a little bit more direct, on LinkedIn, you really need to first just make the connection and connect through business. And then it's almost like once you've connected and you've earned their trust a little bit so that they know you're not a weirdo, creepy person, then you can say, I know this might be strange, but I actually was wondering if you might be, if, if you might be open to getting coffee as a date and, and like give them the out. Like I, you know, if, if that's too weird for this venue, I totally understand. And keep in mind that they may say thank you, no thank you, and they may even block you because that is not the purpose of LinkedIn. But I want you to use all the tools that are available to you. So if that is the place that you have to connect with this person and that's the only space, don't waste it. Don't waste the opportunity. But also just keep in mind, it's kind of like, <laughs> like, would you approach a date at somebody's funeral? Like, I don't know if you make a connection with someone, you don't quite want them to get away, but you don't want to ask them out like right there. So it's kind of like that. You have to keep the venue in mind, whether you're online or offline. So that's my take on LinkedIn DM slides. You can do it. Just tread lightly. If you can figure out the mutual connection, which may require you to pay for premium. I know how all of y'all hate paying for premium on anything. 
But on LinkedIn, you can get access to more information if you pay for the LinkedIn premium. And in this particular case, it might be worth it. Or you might find that it's like Bob from Boise who you met on a flight, you know, 10 years ago. And then you're like, well, that's no help. And sometimes the person doesn't even know that person. I, a lot of times people have reached out to me on LinkedIn and been like, I see that you're connected to so-and-so. And I'm like, I don't even know how I got connected to that person. So I can't quite help you with that. But hey, appreciate the effort. People always appreciate the effort. So I hope that inspires you, Chris, to make your move. And I hope that also inspired some of you to join me for the Dates and Mates Method, which actually we're we're doing an early bird special this week only. If you want to learn the real method for modern dating, you have a chance to write scripts and opening lines. You can play with flirting exercises and conversation techniques. You can build that connector circle that we were talking about and come up with a strategy and a plan to approach them. And there's so much more inside the Dates and Mates method. And we just enroll once a year for this program. So the time is now. Before you start checking your calendar, and you're like, well, I don't know. The fall gets busy and cuffing season, but like my grandma's coming to town. And I, like, if you're looking for the perfect time to start a dating plan and you're scouring your calendar for the perfect moment, I promise you, you're not going to find it. You have to create it. So the moment is now. We only do this once a year. So guess what? Your calendar just lined up with the opportunity to do the Dates and Mates method. And you can get $500 off tuition using this early bird rate that's good this week only. It expires on Sunday. Go right now to DemonaHoffman.com slash method to reserve your space today. The link will be in the show notes. All right. If you have a question like Chris, the DMs are open. We are now back in full swing for season 12, and we want to know what's on your mind. You can DM me at Demona Hoffman on TikTok, X, Facebook, and Instagram. I don't know why I'm still hanging on to this X, y'all, but we're going to make it. We're going to make it a thing. <laughs> you can also give me a call at 424-246-6255. Send in your question. Somebody else has that question. I guarantee you there's somebody else listening who was thinking the same thing about LinkedIn, and Chris sending in his question really helped everybody else. So my friends, that is our premiere episode of season 12 of Dates and Mates. You'll probably recognize our guest for next week from Netflix's hit show, Too Hot to Handle. It's intimacy expert, Brendan Durrell. And keep those questions coming because we have an all Dear Demona episode coming your way soon. Welcome to season 12. And until next week, I wish you happy dating.